permitted the same amount of temporary signage as three occupied tenant spaces. That would allow you six on each parcel, uh, 32 square feet each, uh, so uh, 32 square feet each uh, freestanding temporary sign. Uh, so you would, instead of saying one, you would say six. So that would be um, 64 times, oh, actually you only need to do two. Uh, so it would be, it would be like uh, 100 and so if each, uh, if each uh, occupied tenant space is uh, 64 square feet, you would just have to say two occupied tenant spaces, and that would cover a we little bit more We get you 128 square foot. Um, yeah, 30, or, you get two signs, 32 square foot gotcha. each for one tenant. So you would just double that, and you would be allowed, you know, 124, I think it is. Okay, yeah. so let me give a, a working example. The vacant lot adjacent to family video the vacant lot on 72 and whatever that is, Rolla Street. Uh, Rolla Street, across from the cemetery. Those are large lots during a political season, if you will. A lot of signs. So are we saying that we're not limiting the number of signs, but all of the square combined square footage on that no. one? No, it's number. Commercial areas are limited to two signs, uh, two temporary signs if they're temporary freestanding signs. Each one of those could be up to 32 square feet. Um, so. Okay, let me put, it, put in my words again. Yeah. The big lot that's across both of those lots, the next election comes along. You're saying that those lots could only have two signs up to 32 square feet. Right now, each lot uh, would be, yeah, two signs of up to 32 square feet. So that's a significant change, at least with respect to those two lots. Yeah, if you increase it, there would be four signs, 32 square feet each, or multiple, you know, all. But ultimately, it's the square footage, or it's the number of signs, or signs plus square footage? It's the number of signs, and then each sign is limited in size when it comes to temporary freestanding signs. Um, can we just make sure? So, what James Richard's suggesting is that we consider this vacant commercial lot being equivalent to two occupied tenants on a space that would, which would allow four, yeah, four 30 32, 32 square foot signs. But I don't, I don't see, you know, I don't see it. I, I don't know how you justify it though. Well, before you say justify yeah. it or not, let's yeah. look at reality and history on what has occurred at least on those two signs those two lots, which I don't think I've ever heard anybody say is offensive, but. I don't know, I'd have to think about how you justify that. I guess what I'm really after is, is this changing what normally happens on those two lots, yes or no? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Because right now it's unlimited, number of signs unlimited for 30 days before the election. And actually the current, uh, the current ordinance doesn't even say when you have to pull those signs down. So that's the only way, that's really the only way I see that this ordinance is more restrictive, in a sense, because you, be, right now you can have unlimited signs, uh, uh, political, uh, political signs. signs for 30 days. But it's more liberal in the sense that you can ha now have those public political signs for more than 30 days, but we limit the size and yeah. number. So. I'm struggling a little bit with, you know, we encourage people to run for elected positions. You know, this is one of those ways that somebody supports their cause. And are we being too restrictive in that particular application? I don't think so. Uh, the, actually, most uh, most so the model codes they usually it's more well much more restrictive than that. Um, it's they usually like for one for instance one says. You can have unlimited, uh, they call them um, free expression, free expression signs, uh, but they have to, they're none, no one of them can be more than three square feet. Okay. So, so back to Jonathan. So I thought I understood Jonathan's request, but I might not. I thought he was saying on a non residential <coughs> vacant lot going up to at least three four by eight signs. Is that what he's asking? Correct. 
So, and we could do that, but we're gonna have to dis we're gonna have to define a vacant lot as being equivalent to two, yeah, um, tenant spaces, which would allow four. Okay, how big you is a tenant? Four by what is it? I mean, help me understand. What is a tenant space, and how big is that? It, it's it's on, I mean, a tenant space. It's. They can be smaller. They can be big. It's <laughs> that's not the right answer. It's oh. any, have, it's any occupant on that piece of they property. They have to be defined. Yeah, the tenants obviously a vacant lot there. that's an acre is different than a vacant lot that's a hundred foot by a hundred foot. I would think. Yeah, that's true. Um, I, we don't define tenant space. It's just it's just com it's kind of. It's wherever one part of the building is used for one tenant. Uh, that's how I would define it. Um, we're talking about vacant lots, and we're saying that you can do this based on two tenant lots, tenant. but we don't define a tenant lot or a space. Tenant space. But a tenant is any occupant, regardless of size, on a, on a lot. So what we're saying with the underlying recommendation is that we're here at saying a vacant parcel permitted the same is one occupied tenant space, which would be two signs. We could double that in order to get to the square footage that Jonathan was after. But you'd still be limited by four 32 square foot signs. And all you would have to do is change this one word from one to two. Right. Or 96 one foot signs. Or no. Well, 32. Hey, amount, I thought it was. That's, That's what I'm asking. Is it? Could you have smaller signs? No. That, no. That's not what he said. That's what I thought, but that's not what he said. No, you're limited no, to. No, but that's what I thought Jonathan was suggesting. Also. Oh, mm -hmm. so kind of do it like we do the, the residential zoning districts where it's unlimited number. You're saying right. those, kept parts, by square those lots, you could have, if we change it, three signs that are up to four by eight in size. No, if we change it, we could have four. And each one can, each one of those signs can be they're up to 32 square feet. If we change the one to two. Occupied tenant spaces because each uh, occupied or each occupied uh, yeah tenant spaces. So you could have two. four up to four signs that it would a cumulative area of thirty two square feet. Each, each one, one is limited to thirty two. Now, if you wanted to do it similar to similar to the now the residential zoning district, but it's four signs. Any way you cut it, it's up to four signs. Four signs. It doesn't matter how big they are as long as they're less than thirty two square feet. Okay. And that wouldn't allow the little one. You know, if you had four, two big or four big ones, you wouldn't be allowed any little ones. But in residential zones, how did we? Hold on, hold on. Hold on. Yeah, that's my point. Hold on. Yeah. No, you can have the little ones. They just can't be bigger than four by eight. Yeah, I'm you saying if they had. I, no, I'm saying if they had. Four. So you're allowing me to have a four signs that could, in theory, be a cumulative total of 128 square foot. Mm -hmm. Right. That's true. Mm -hmm. if, with the Can two, I have 128 no. one foot no. signs? No, not in uh, commercial districts. That's okay. how we did it in residential so the, districts. So the, it's four, any, any basically size up to. No bigger than that. Up to. Up to. You get four, uh, if we do it this way, up each one up to 32 square feet. Okay, I got it. I just had a quick thing. Um, you did mention previously we had something in there about political science. Did you remove that because it's content-based? Yes. Okay. okay. That's so my question, and I, I understand, and I think it makes sense what we're talking about here with the political science. I'm, I just want to make sure that if we do go in this direction, there's a possibility that some other vacant lot that has nothing to do with political signs could put these up at any other times, not during election times or anything else, could be putting these up for certain amounts of times and lots of them. Just want to mention that. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. They can put anything. Well, they can do that now. Well, well no, because it's politically based before, and now it's not. we're taking that out. And that was only 30 days before the election. And if they're political, churches put up their little. Like, and you pulled the political thing because it, technically we can't do the. We were had it wrong. We can't especially do content not, based. Especially non commercial speech. Yeah, you can yeah, differentiate. Now, you, I don't know if I want to do that. But you can. I mean, <laughs> there is a, a thing where you can limit. You can uh, have one time events. So if you said. Right. You said, you know, every two years. And I don't know if right. you want to do this, James. The, the, the point I wanted to make is just like, I think the initial reason we had from what some of the older council folks had said from a long time back, it was a bunch of people putting out, for example, 200 Pepsi signs or something along their business. If someone had a vacant lot in the future, they could put up some pretty big 
signs and amounts if we if we go this direction, I guess. Well, on a vacant lot, on a vacant lot, right? Sorry, I, I wasn't following. Sorry. Uh, I was just making the point that it sounds like 20 years ago when we first made the sign ordinance, yeah. we were worried about places that put out tons of signs or large ones that, that kind of got a little bit of clutter. If we had vacant lots, we could be, if we change it in this way, we could be inviting that for non-political signs too, correct? Um, well, yeah, I mean, it, it can be, it can be, but it, but it's still limited by, off-premises still limited by two mm -hmm. signs, so. So it would be limited to non-commercials. Basically, a vacant lot, the only thing you can, there's nothing, there's no business there, so it would be limited to non-commercial speech. Um, because you, ah. except, non for, except for 15 days a quarter, mm -hmm. uh, every quarter of the year, you could put off-premise signs yep. there. So, okay. so people could use it as a billboard space. Okay. And they could actually do that now yeah. with, the, with the current proposal, because sure. you can have off-premise. I think, I think you answered my question. My main thing was just for all of us to know that we, there's other things. If we go the direction of political science, it sounds like there's some other things to think about. Yeah. Uh, but that's what it is. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Brian? Yeah. You're, you're talk, we're talking about temporary signs. What's the definition of a temporary versus a permanent sign? What would keep somebody from putting up one of these four by eight signs and saying, it's permanent, I'm going to leave it year round? This is a permanent sign. Uh, temporary freestanding signs are, they have to be easily, they have to either sit on top of the ground or they have to be easily removable. Um, by hand, so um, you can't pull a fence post out by hand most of the time, and that's something that we're going to temporary really is not time driven. My understanding of this, no, it's that's just like the type of sign. That's how you distinguish the type right. of sign. So a fence post, if you can't, that's how it's defined. Easily re either sits on top of the ground for well temporary freestanding signs, either sits on top of the ground or easily removable by hand, such as an H frame. And almost easier to describe a permanent sign because there's a definition for how what it constitutes a permanent sign, which requires a permit to be erected and has separate limitations on the on the number and size and that kind of thing. So, um, okay. Do we deal? But why are we making a mountain out of a molehill? That's what mm -hmm. we have. We didn't have any real problem before, and this this. Usually, it's a big political arena right here in Raleigh. Everybody that's doing anything does a lot of campaigning in Raleigh, and you know that. Those signs are, are there for only for a short period of time. Who cares how many there are there? If it's my lot and I want to let those guys put their sign there, they ought to be able to put it there. It don't make any difference how many there are. The only problem I have is that after the election is gone, they're supposed to pick up their signs, they're still strung out all over the county. And those people need to take put down the location of their signs and pick them up. And, and that's really what the city's current regu sign regulations allow. They prohibited temporary signs, but they allowed, through exception, all political signs. In the Supreme Court case, it, the town was actually in trying to restrict the, the duration of the political signs. And that's what opened up the, sort of the whole oh. content-based issue. Yeah, that, yeah. They, they differentiated between uh, directional signs for, for nonprofit organizations and political signs. And uh, one other that was not commercial speech, but it's because they were differentiating, differentiating between that content for not commercial speech that was facially unconstitutional. So in these particular examples, Jimmy Dale, correct me if I'm wrong, somebody can put up a temporary sign 365 days and it doesn't have to be a political sign. That's what you're buying into. Yeah. It was, everything was complaint driven before and that's the only reason we're here now. I don't ever remember receiving a complaint about these vacant lots and signs. All I've received complaints about is from businesses and their feather signs and so on. I'm not sure why this is even an issue. Um, may I say something about the the permanent and temporary. So you're allowed two temporary on a commercial property, but you're also allowed one freestanding permanent sign up to 400 square feet. So somebody can take a vacant lot and they can put up a permanent sign of up to 400 square feet and they can post a political, political, uh, a non-commercial speech on that also. Um, but James, like we did on the residential zones, could we approach vacant non-residential properties or commercial properties 
with a restriction of just the size rather than the number. Yeah, I mean, and what, sure, do, or what does a, that sure open there's up? There's a way for it, but I would have to like, you know, think about it. So you want to, you want to. So we would just do it like how we do in the residential zoning districts: Correct. unlimited signs up to the square footage. Square footage, and that's, and then not base it on, uh, not base it on the tenant space. Correct. We could just base it on the property. Right. And then we could just say, up to however many square feet, ninety-four square feet, um, for free, free. Mm. But then we differentiate between the different types also. And also, uh, once something goes over 76 square feet, it's considered a billboard also. This is something that I definitely will need to talk, uh, to think about, not just just change it without thinking about it, uh, without so sitting how, down. How so I hate to prolong the agony of this. Can, can we go through and based upon what we know with these amendments, pass it, and then give some time to this last particular issue, and then if necessary, come back and change that one? Sure. Yeah, we can always, council can always amend it, you know, afterwards. This whole issue is driven by businesses and they're wanting to advertise. And that, that's the issue we need to address here. This other stuff we can worry about later, okay? We need to take care of our small local businesses. You know, we started out addressing two or three pretty small but important issues, the sandwich sign and a few of that. And I think where it got complex is once we got into this Supreme Court issue, where now we had to clean up the whole kit and caboodle. Right. That's what's the, that's the change, Jimmy Dale. We couldn't do a surgical change like we thought we could. And there's, sorry, well, there's would, many, go would, ahead. Was we having a problem? Before this all started, well, I mean, the the old ordinance basically prohibited temporary signs, so that you know the business community certainly thought that was a problem. When we got into trying to find some relief for them, you have to be able to well, look at the sign in order to determine the content on the sign, and so that raised the question of political signs. The problem, no. just take the thing well, out. The temporary yeah, the sign thing, thing out. The other thing, Jimmy Dale, what happened is it was complaint driven. There was complaints. Correct me if I'm wrong, Steve. We went to address that complaint, and that particular person said, "Well, what about him and him and him and him and him?" So now we got 20 other complaints. That's is that what essentially happens? Okay, so we so we got lots of complaints. One person, one impacted person, ended up complaining about a whole, a whole lot of other people. The so the city it. staff has to be consistent. Well, the way to solve it is just do away with the sign orders all together and be done with it. No. Well, it would solve the problem, would it not? No, 15 years ago, the, the community came to us and says, clean up these signs. But it's pretty well cleaned up. They won't be. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you take away the ordinance, and you're going to go back to the Wild West. I'm talking about this one here. What's council's pleasure? I, I, if you're going to address these proposed changes, there's... There's two or three of them, I guess. Um, we'd have to have an amendment and a vote on each one of those. It's probably the smart thing to do. And then you can decide what you want to do with this last one. That's supposed to say. Everything we're seeing on the screen here is uh, amendments. Yeah. Well, the um, this is supposed to say Just the underlying. Oh, the underlying yeah. Yeah. yeah, this is yeah. supposed to say proposed here. Right. So the first and the third have nothing underlined. They're already. So that's that's the, the second exist and the fourth. Yes, yeah, the second and the fourth that are amending the first and the third references there. So it would be no, a pr proposing current. Gotcha. Yeah, and and what James pointed out on the fourth bullet point where it says current language, that should be proposed. So uh, current proposed, current proposed, and then the third one is just a, a uh, cleanup. For for vacant lots, we could just say un unlimited up to up to you know ninety or whatever it was. Oh, yeah, ninety six square foot was ninety six square feet. You could say instead of saying vacant lot, a vacant parcel would be permitted the same amount of temporary signage as one occupant yeah. tenants. But yeah. you could say charge, right? vacant think, parcel is the bomb thing, no permitted only uh, temporary freestanding signs, the uh, and in, in an unlimited amount yes, of them. Uh, but they are limited to total what, square footage of ninety, six. just ninety six. Thirty two times three. Now you could do that instead of saying this, and that, I think that would be that would address the political side. 
So, so Mayor, why don't you just all right, so let's start with the first one. The current language of 244.5. Is there a motion to amend the, the ordinance to adopt the proposed language of 244.5? I'll make that motion. The motion is there a second? I'll second. Motion is second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. One, let the record show one no. Is there a motion? I'm trying to think of how to word this one. Can I clarify if we do make a change on yes. that? Is it a non all it's gonna be non commercial uh, signage? This is, yeah, this, this first uh, non commercial or no? Th that's all re residential the, under 42 244. The first, right. the first two are residential, the other two are um, for commercial, pro non residential properties. Non residential properties, but the speech itself speech can be commercial is, speech yeah. too. It, no, it does, okay, we don't, do, we don't distinguish between that. that. We just say off premise or on premise. Okay, okay. okay. So, so, so it could be a big. Sign for a commercial for, but it has to be. It has to, the business has to be located on that parcel. To be, to be, so it would be a vacant parcel would be limited to not a commercial speech, except for those 15 days where they're limited. Uh, you can have the off premise signs. You can have an off premise. 15 days of off premise. Whatever they now, want. Now, now they. It's 15 days per quarter. Per quarter of a year. Correct. That's right. Days a quarter, they could put whatever they want up there, commercial or otherwise. So you can do that back. Any off premise, yeah, commercial, mm -hmm. yeah. Or recorded. If it's not, if it has to be commercial, it is a quarter of the off premise. Yeah. Otherwise, it's off premise. Okay. Um, no, 15. Is there a motion? Go ahead. Go ahead. But Stephen had a question. No. So, <laughs> so on that 15 days per quarter, how do you count those 15 days? Like, it'll be the last 15 days and then the first 15 days? It's back to back? Once we see it, then we say you have to have this down within 14 days. We, well, once we see it or get a complaint, uh, that's in the ordinance. Uh, it says whenever you are notified, you have 14 days to get this off of your property. And then you can't put it up for another Until 90 days. Until the next quarter of the year. So are we, we saying quarters like January to? Yeah, it, every three months. There you go. Three times it almost needs to be quarterly. quarterly. It'll be January, January five, through March, January, February, April. February, April. End of the March right. would be a quarter of the year. But if you put it up in March. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, guess. Well, I, don't know. I did want to say one thing though but they each commercial property is allowed a permanent sign of up to 400 square feet now, yeah but that's could, not what they're talking about for this i know but if you if you set up a permanent sign you could put as many temporary signs on you could post as many messages you want on there so you see what i'm saying you, this is actually you actually have 400 square but, feet. But no, own, no owner of a vacant lot's going to mm -hmm. do that on behalf of a, of a public lot. <laughs> yeah. well, they, they could, but that's just that's a billboard then. Yeah. No but it's it. not a, it's a billboard is off premise. Uh, this is just this, a permanent sign. So, yeah. Yeah. Permanent. Yeah. so instead of putting it in the ground, you could actually just post <laughs> it up on the permanent sign. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Is there a motion? Go ahead, John. I was going to say, James, on, on the second proposed, so the fourth bullet, can you recite recite what you were suggesting on yeah. the on the last sentence? It's underlined as to how that could work with a maximum of ninety six square foot rather than a limit to the number of signs. Yeah. A vacant parcel uh, shall be permitted an unlimited amount of temporary freestanding signs um, with a cumulative total of ninety six so square long, feet. Right. So long as the uh, so long as the total uh, area uh, sign area does not exceed ninety six square. So, is there a motion to amend the ordinance from the current, on your screens, current language of 244.7 to the proposed language underneath it with the change to 96 cumulative square feet? So moved. Regardless of the number of signs. Regardless of the number of signs. Unlimited temporary free, freestanding signs no. with a limit of 96 square feet. So there's a motion. Is there a second? Second. Motion and second. All in favor say aye. 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 No. All opposed? No. No. No, no. Show me no's. Two no's. Three no's. No. Three no's. The third one. Is there 
a motion to amend the or proposed ordinance deleting section 42244.2. I'll make that motion. So motion is there a second? Just so I'm clear, we're going to delete this, decorations. and we're just going to not have anything covering decorations, correct? So you can have, like, Christmas decorations. Mm -hmm. up, but Do you have a second? Second. No. We have a second. We have a second. All in favor? I guess. Say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay. So final reading with the three amended. Did you write that all down? <laughs> and that's, that's point two J. <clears throat> An ordinance amending Article 3 of Chapter 42, which is known in, as the Rolla Planning and Zoning Code by deleting and adding language to Division 18 of said article, which is known as signs, for the particular purpose of permitting temporary and portable signage, sign ordinance, including the three amendments as stated on the record. Sufficient. I'll do it. He took it off the screen. You're asking. <laughs> oh, sorry. I can read them. You got it. Okay. Read them if you have to. In the essence of time, you don't have to. Can you just cite them? Or something? Uh, yes. Um, including the amendment to section 42-244.5a, adding the words that are vacant between districts and that are vacant or between the words districts and contained in section 42-244.7a adding the words independently occupied between the words each and tenant and adding the sentence at the end a vacant parcel will be permitted the same amount of temporary signage up no. to 96 square feet um, a, bar, a vacant parcel shall be permitted unlimited temporary freestanding signs as long as the total sign area does not exceed 96 square feet is it temporary signage it's it's very important to put freestanding temporary signs okay and then delete section 42-244.2J regarding exempt signs decorations. Okay, we have the final reading. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Motion made and second. Roll call vote. Roeder? Yes. Crow? Yes. Murphy? Yes. Shot? Yes. Young? Yes. Willie? Yes. Jones? Yes. Everly? Yes. Henry? Yes. Williams? No. Muche? Yes. Two nays and one nay. The ordinance is approved. Next item is the ordinance adopting the 2018 International Code. Mayor, before we move on, I do have a question. With with regards to this now, if, if we have someone that comes to the city and they want a business license, are we educating them on this? As you know, if they if they purchase that business license, do we make sure that they are well aware of these? Um, we're going to send out a, a, a leaflet to all the all the existing. Well, well, but yes, it, it will I mean, be something. We I mean, specifically, I want new new businesses to understand mm -hmm. what these are, so we educate them because I think they're most likely the ones that are going to want to put up a bunch of stuff that we just limited, and so I want to make sure that they're. Not buying a bunch of things or investing time and, and resources into stuff that they can't do. We actually do that now. We do. Yeah. With our old code. I, I would also um, send a I'm, I would also send a letter to the local political headquarters or whatever with the season coming up. Okay. I just want to make sure that, yeah. that we're doing our part to educate now that we have this new set of rules. Okay. We'll send up Steve, a, I have a question for you. Okay. So in the last six months, we've held this sort of an abeyance while we've sorted all this out. Looking back on what we adopted versus what's out there today, I don't know if when we held it in abeyance, if other people sort of put a few more signs up or whatever. How are we going to handle that? Good question. Uh, <laughs> we're going to start out uh, very slowly. Uh, uh, Naturally, when grass season is here, we have, we have our uh, inspector Kathleen out about the city. Uh, we're going to first maybe try to uh, hit the main areas and try to educate. We have flyers 
on new businesses when we do do the business license uh, inspection we let them know what type of signage they can have so and we'll just change that pamphlet okay thank you okay. Daniel with tax season coming up does the city have any kind of mailings that go out to uh, the cities for their taxes or anything like that we could piggyback something into the, the county issues the tax bills nothing that we put out, out. We do on business license updates uh, send a, send out mailers, and we have in the past included little flyers and that. So we'll, I'll probably get with Stephanie see if something can be worked out. There. Thank you. Okay, building codes. I thought mine was going to be the hardest. <laughs> <laughs> so back on uh, on June 18th, uh, City Council uh, uh, requested that staff look at the uh, newer codes and bring back a recommendation for adoption of a newer code. We've done that. Uh, we had the first reading back on December 3rd, uh, and I've included uh, in previous package and in this package the uh, ICC codes, which we recommend adopting, which is a 2018 uh, set of ICC codes, along with the 2017 NEC National Electrical Code, uh, with the proposed uh, changes uh, with the ordinances as far as when it comes to residential spring. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. See, this set of the six thousand dollars you have as books those are hardback books or that's an online subscription or what no is they're paperback books okay we, we 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 like to have each inspector have a set of books we have to keep uh i think two sets with uh, hand with so how much Carol. is a set about 600 or six to eight hundred okay. we're hoping I was asking if if local contractors or whatever could come in and look at them read them whatever um, we're we've in the past uh, uh, given them a little experts out of that copyrighted material that they can look at. Yes, we don't copy it; we just let them look <laughs> at it. So rather than saying that, <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping you would say, "Yeah, here, Joe, here's the book. If you want to go in the other room and read it." Oh yes, we notes. do that. We do that. That's the answer. Yeah. Thank you. But when, but I, I have found out that uh, it's easier to sit down with them and explain. Well, with a lot of what it says because it, it's pretty intimidating. Okay. Questions for Steve or, or Chief? I don't have a question, but I have a comment. Just um, I know that your department has done a lot with the signs and with the building codes recently. Um, it's been a lot of work for you all. And I just want to recognize that and say thank you and Chief Smith and also James. I know he did a lot of work. Thanks for doing all that. I know it's kind of a little extra than you normally have to deal with. Um, but I think the citizens all appreciate it. I know it's been a lot of work, so thanks a lot. A lot of hours. Yeah. I had a question. Yes. Is uh, January 1st, 2019 enough time for you guys to get speed with the 2018 regulations and to be, to be able to start to enforce that? Uh, yes, that was our goal. That's, that was our goal in the beginning. Uh, the, uh, uh, we, we need to set a date that's, that's uh, recognizable to the inspectors to know what code is going to be enforced on which project. So it's easy to look at that permit and say, okay, this permit was issued in 2019, one of the new codes. Sure. I, I, I totally agree with you, but that's uh, like 10 days away. And if we haven't ordered our books yet, my question is, do we, is January 1st really the... We have, we have, we've been pouring, the set of books that we have, we've been... So you have a set that you guys have been working oh, on. Yeah. This we, is just we, additional we ordered sets. One set. that you don't need. Okay. And, and they're about yeah. hazard. <laughs> we, we've been tearing them up, you know, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but yes, I mean, it's I have to be honest with you, it's gonna be a learning experience for my inspectors and and the contractors. Uh, there's a lot of different nuances in the in the code that's that's uh, and again I don't want to get into a long spiel uh, on the technical side of it, but in, in light of the uh, tornado uh, in Joplin it really it really kicked a lot of, uh, of requirements in for the wind loads and stuff in this area. So that kinda had a trickle down effect for all the codes. So as far as bracing goes and everything. So it, it's, it's really going to be uh, it's, it, it's really going to be time consuming and, and getting everybody back on, on uh, with the with the contractors and my inspectors because we've been inspecting this code since hmm, since I've been here. It's been a while. Steve, so. yeah. I talked to two or three contractors one Thursday night, and their their main concern is about the, the steel on the concrete. That's okay. that's their biggest gripe. Right? I think uh, they're not really concerned about the influx of uh, prices and stuff like that. But, and there's a way around that. And I think
think they know it, but they it's going to be it's going to cost them to have it done. Really, I was looking at the codes today, and with the the majority of soil conditions we have here in Rolla, and the uh, if just a, an average foundation, eight foot tall for a residence, uh, you know they're they're basically they're going to be required to put horizontal steel every uh, four foot and then vertical steel every four foot, which really the majority of them on a vertical steel, if they don't use a keyway, they'll use, and I don't want to get into technical, they'll use stab in rebar every four foot anyway, but they only put them in two to four foot tall. They're just going to extend that to eight foot tall, and they're going to have to put another uh, horizontal bar in uh, halfway in the wall. A lot of them do it now, but the requirement right now for uh, this uh, seismic category, which we're in C, is really nothing. Steve, we got a lot of plastic soil in this area too. We have have some. We don't have. We don't run into a lot of plastic soil. Anytime we run into un, uh, unrecognizable or, or or something that we're not concerned of, or we're concerned about that there, that may be a, a questionable material, now we we require them to either, uh, well, in in almost all cases, get a, a professional design on that, and most of the time. They like to do that. When we go out and we probe a, a, a footing and we stick a four foot probe right down in the ground with no resistance at all, we're going to question that. And we do have some of that material here, but we don't run into a lot. But, uh, but either dig through it, get some, get it something down on something hard, or, or get us a, a letter or a design from a professional which we can accept. Mm -hmm. We don't, I mean, that's the first part of this house. You don't want to get a, get the ridge cap on and find out you got issues. Okay. Any other questions for Steve or Chief? If not, can we have a final reading? <clears throat> An ordinance amending Chapter 6, Article 3, Section 6-16 and 6-17 relating to building regulations and the adoption of the 2018 International Building Code. And 2018 International Existing Building Code, Chapter 6, Article 4, Section 6-40 and 6-41 relating to Mechanical Code and adoption of the 2018 International Mechanical Code. Chapter 6, Article 5, Section 6-47 and 6-48 relating to plumbing code and the adoption of the 2018 International Plumbing Code. Chapter 6, Article 6, Section 6-55 and 6-56, relating to residential code and the adoption of the International Residential Code. And the 2018 International Swimming Pool and Spa Code, Article, Chapter 10, Article 1, Section 10-9, relating to in general. And Chapter 10, Article 2, Sections 10-20, 10-22, and 10-23, relating to standards and specifications in the adoption of the 2017 National Electrical Code, Chapter 14, Article 1, Sections 14-1 and 14-2, relating to the fire protection and the adoption of the 2018 International Fire Code, and Chapter 20, Article 1, Sections 20-1 and 20-2, relating to the Property Maintenance Code and the adoption of the 2018 International Property Maintenance Code, all of the code of the City of Rolla, Missouri. Mm -hmm. Second. Motion man second. Roll call vote. Jones? Yes. Williams? Yes. Young? Yes. Woolley? Yes. Murphy? Yes. Henry? Yes. Crow? Yes. Muche? Yes. Broder? Yes. Everly? Yes. Shot? Yes. 11 A's. Ordinance is approved. Last item under old business is an ordinance approving a technical city services agreement with Rolla Public Library. Good evening. This is the final reading before the ordinance with the contract for the Rolla Public Library. Uh, the changes that were noted in your packet and were mentioned at last meeting is a, a more definition to Section 2 and Section 7. So what you have in the packet is the modification for that. And with those um, recommendations, staff is approving uh, the proposed contract as amended. <clears throat> Any questions for Stephanie? Can we raise the issue? One of the things we've been talking about, because we provide these services for probably six, seven, eight. Thirteen. Thirteen different entities out there, and it, the workload becomes extensive with the amount on finance. So we're not prepared tonight to say what we might get away from or back off of, but this is proposing a four-year extension to this agreement. Suggestion is, why don't we look at doing this through 2019, and we can next year. And we'll just revisit this and probably look at all of them and see if it makes sense for us to be doing that kind of work for up to 13 different entities. I mean, that, we, some make sense for us to do, others a little less. 
some like library take a lot more time than some of the other ones so just a suggestion to amend this to a one-year extension through to December 31 2019 and we'll spend some time reviewing all of these yeah. so staff does this quote-unquote at cost meaning their hourly wages but it's not really addressing the what I call the opportunity cost so is this the highest and best use of Stephanie's time and staff I have staff, staff time so that's essentially what we're going to look at I have a question uh, maybe for Stephanie um, these subdivisions whatever who want to use our accounting services I'm just curious why aren't they just using private entities And most of them did. Most of them did at one point, and they just ran into either difficulty getting information, management, technical support, those kinds of things. These are tend to be small organizations, volunteer boards, sometimes with a staff member, in some cases not even a, a full-time staff person to keep the books. And so over what's happened over time, they've just been concerned at some point in the organization, and they would approach us about it. We've, we've been doing the Phelps County Emergency Services Board since we basically spun off dispatch services, and that sort of snowballed into picking up entities where, where are the services we can provide those other public entities can be very valuable for them it's just become a lot to manage yeah some of these are very small a little sewer district or something like that we have a couple of essential volunteers <coughs> in the neighborhood uh, some started out small that are bigger Rolla rural is a fine example today you know they have a they have a revenue stream and they're probably ready to be on their own they actually take less time than some of the sewer districts. Okay. Just for the record. Stephanie? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Duly noted. Of, of these 13 entities, how much time, I mean, are we talking for you and your staff? Um, each entity has its own separate answer to that question, but in general, um, the library is one of the most um, user demanding organizations. Demanding is a good word. Um, for that we do HR services as well as full accounting for them um, the next one that we'll talk about the PCESB that's very minimal um, we maybe we meet once a month to do checks I think we do on average anywhere between four to ten checks per month for them so that's very easy um, the other one that we will address tonight Rolla rule we do five checks per month there's no paid people on there no benefits administration I attend maybe one or two board meetings um, mostly for budget the second I think Lance and I attended one because they had a legal issue very minimal um, once I get an organization um, cleaned up if they're having issues I hand it over to one of my staff people so in a given year what do you think we're billing these 13 total entities um, I know for sure our, I think Rolla rule we end up billing around 5,000 <coughs> um, Edgar Springs I think we end up billing about a thousand fifteen hundred it is based on 15 minute increments almost like CPA billing is what we do um, we do include salary and benefits we bill for all supplies we bill for everything it's nothing that's a free you know sure or anything like that um, library we bill around 5,000 depending on time sewer districts are a little cheaper um, but they're most is billing customer service there's a lot of um, especially with the three new districts there's a lot of maintenance at this time for them so do you think it's safe to say it's between 30 and 40k a year Total? Um, that would be that would probably be 25 to 35. 25 to 35. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So I think it's just worth pulling it all together. And Matt, Mayor asked if we just pulled it, yeah, data together. They're good questions, and I, I think we just need to step back a little bit and look at them. Yeah, I think that would be a good idea. So we're not necessarily suggesting that this isn't something we would still bring back to council, and some of these we renew for longer. I think if we just the ones that are renewing, we just say let's do a year, and we'll come back and spend a little bit deeper dive. Otherwise, we're in this for four years, and we don't even look at it for another three and a half years at this point. They're three-year contracts. Four years. I mean, this makes sense for entities that are located in the city, like the library, for example. But like Edgar Springs, I'm not sure that it makes sense to do that. I guess we should look at. It. Final reading, please. Is there a motion to amend it to 2019? Yes, yeah. I'd make the motion to amend it to 2019. For section six and section eight. Is there a second on the second. amendment? Daniel seconded. Second. Um, <clears throat> roll call vote, please. Oh, no, wait. Um, Just all in favor of the amendment changes, say aye. 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 Opposed? Final reading. 
an ordinance authorizing the mayor of the city of Rolla, Missouri to execute on behalf of the city of Rolla, Missouri a technical assistance contract between the city of Rolla, Missouri and the Rolla Public Library as amended for motion. Second. Motion made and second. Uh, roll call vote. Woolley? Yes. Henry? Yes. Murphy? Yes. Williams? Yes. Young? Yes. Mush? Yes. Roeder? Yes. Eberly? Yes. Crow? Yes. Shot? Yes. Jones? Yes. 11 A's. Ordinance is approved. Moving on to new business, the first is an ordinance approving the technical services agreements with the Cobb County Emergency Services. Um, this is basically the first reading, similar contract as the organizations before. I will draw your attention to item number seven. The additional piece in this contract is that the police department, because they house the PCESB or the 911 center in the basement, they do some oversight with their, not only just the, the telecommunications chief, but also their executive secretary. So we've added $6,500 that is billed directly for the police department activity in addition to my time, my staff time, and any audit services that we provide. Um, so again, this contract is pretty identical to the other, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Yes. We, were, we were looking to amend this one to 2019 as well? Okay. Uh, my suggestion is yeah, we okay. look at all of them that yeah. way. I'd make a motion to do that. Okay. Motion made and second to amend two sections, section six and eight. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? A second. Final, uh, first reading. An ordinance authorizing the mayor of the city of Rowland, Missouri to execute on behalf of the city of Rowland, Missouri a technical assistance contract between the city of Rowland, Missouri and the Phelps County Emergency Services Board. Next item is an ordinance approving a technical services agreement with Edgar Springs Rural Fire Protection District. This one is a three year contract. It will expire in 2021. And it's identical to the library board and the other contracts. It does not include the 6,500, so I'd be happy to answer any questions. I uh, move that we amend this to a one-year term. So that would be sections eight and six. six. Second. All in favor of the proposed amendments? Aye. 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 All opposed? First reading, please. And ordinance authorizing the mayor of the city of Rolla, Missouri to execute on behalf of the city of Rolla, Missouri a technical assistance contract between the city of Rolla, Missouri and the Edgar Springs Rural Fire Protection District as amended. First reading. Next item is a request to approve the final plot of High Point West, number two. Thanks. Sure, thank you. The subject lots are located to the west and south of west end of Perot Boulevard in the northern section of Rolla, Missouri, as you can see. Um, this is lot five and six. Of, currently, it's lot five and six of High Point West number one, uh, subdivided, in, and it's going to be subdivided into four lots. It's currently zoned M2. The applicant is the Raleigh Community Development Department. I mean, corporation, sorry about that. And um, Tim Johnson, on behalf of Ameren Transmission Company, has been acting as an agent. Now, Ameren and uh, the RCDC are negotiating a contract to buy lot one of the final plat, which you'll see on the next slide. And this is subject to the approval of this final plat. Ameren plans to build a power station on lot one of that final plat. This is the main section of the final plat. And um, so everything can basically, this is a four lot minor subdivision, so much of the code doesn't apply. There are no public improvements. Um, just I just wanted to go through just a couple things that were uh, 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 unique about this proposal. So um, all non-residential lots are non-residential lots are permitted to not have frontage on a paved. Sorry, non-residential <coughs> lots are, uh, don't need frontage if there's an e a paved easement that goes to them. And so as you can see, lot two and uh, lot three do not front on Perot Boulevard, so they don't have a hundred feet of frontage, which is the uh, minimum amount of frontage an M2 lot must have. So as you can see here, there's an e this is an easement that goes up, up through here and down here. And uh, there's a, uh, two notes on the plat that ensure that these lots will never use, be used for residential purposes because only non-residential lots can have, uh, are, not, are permitted to not have uh, frontage. And there's also a note that states that uh, th there will be this easement will be paved in accordance with the appropriate section. So a section of this will be paved and touch both lot two and the lot three. Um, 
So the only other thing that I would like to say is that uh, this is a flag lot, so it, it won't be able to subdivide. You can't subdivide it unless a road is built into here again. So, but that that should not be an issue since there will be a power electric power station on here. So comment memos from the uh, municipal, Rollo Municipal Utilities and the Public's work, de works Department have been submitted and can be found in your packets. Um, all the requested revision, revisions have been made and easements that the uh, RMU requested have been um, uh, put on the plat. Fire Chief was satisfied with the access to the lots and provisions for water detention and fees for land use disturbance. Land disturbance permits will be satisfied before building permits are issued. Uh, no protest petitions or public comments have been filed to the department to this department community development department and the action required from the planning and zoning commission Sorry, uh, the planning and zoning commission unanimously voted to approve this and the action required from the city council is to um, To uh, have the first reading of this ordinance To conduct a battle of this order. And that's it. Any questions for James? If not, first reading. An ordinance approving the final plat of High Point West number two, which is the minor subdivision plat that subdivides lot five. In lot six of the final plat of the High Point West number one into four lots, High Point West number two. Next item is an ordinance approving the vacation of the utilities. This is on, uh, thank you. This is the, this is on the same lot that's the same. This is on, this is on the land that it is going to be subdivided in the last proposal that I spoke about. Uh, this is RMU is requesting that this portion of this uh, utility easement be vacated. They secured it in 2010 uh, with a, an elect, electric asset purchase about 10 years ago. And uh, RMU does not have any assets located in this portion of the easement. In addition, the easement must be vacated for Amaranth to have full use of the subject parcel and to construct their future improvements, which is an electric power station. And so the action requested from the city council is to conduct the first reading of this proposal and that's it that would vacate the said section of said easement so. any questions for james if not can we have the first reading an ordinance approving the vacation of a utility easement being a fractional part of the south half of lot one of the northwest quarter of section 30 township 38 north Range 7 West of the 5th PM, Rolla, Phelps County, Missouri, City of Rolla. Next item is an ordinance amending section 2792 pertaining to parking on the north side of 10th Street. Darren? So the property owner at 910 West 10th Street, which is owned by Missouri s and is requested no parking zone be added on the north side of their property there. Um, the reason for that is if someone parks in that area when you're trying to plow their parking lot, it really restricts your view. So. Um, staff's requesting first reading of the ordinance. Any but questions for Darren? Yes. How many parking spaces are we taking away here? Approximately three. Okay. I mean, we, we get a lot of these in the university over and over and over, and I'm wondering if the driving force behind this isn't they're wanting to build their parking lots that people have to pay for. No, I'll, I'll defer to them, but I think this is a, a safety issue. I drove over there yesterday because I, I was struggling with this one myself, and I think it could be if you're trying to pull out of those lots. Okay, that makes my I would definitely good. say this one's a safety yeah. issue. The other thing, long-term plans for 10th Street, do we know what they are with respect to parking? I mean, I would like to remove all the parking off that section of 10th Street. I mean, right now there's some residential areas that, you know, wouldn't allow that. But part of our plans, even looking at through the Move Rolla Transportation District and the strategy and all that, is to sort of reassess 10th Street, right. its access, mobility, walkability, rideability, all mm -hmm. those kinds of factors. So some of these areas we are looking at taking off ultimately some parking. Mm -hmm. And I, Brian, I do think your point is valid. It, right. uh, there's nobody was parking on this today. So that who's parking on this is college students. So mm -hmm. there is going to be a, an effort, we think, to try and move those cars back on the parking lots rather than cluttering up streets so so what about uh, like events like football games and graduation would that would it still no parking not, still no parking we can actually grant it I don't know that we would here but there's been cases where we've granted exceptions for those kinds of special events but I mean some, there has been time special events at the last we've been allowed obstruction permits which would allow you know parking in front of those properties pretty rare but that's how we would handle that any other questions? 
first reading, please. An ordinance amending section 27-92 of the general ordinances of the City of Rolla, Missouri, known as the Code of City of Rolla, Missouri, relating to parking. Next item is an ordinance amending section 27-118 of the Code pertaining to parking on 8th Street. So the executive parking commission has requested a, uh, a two-hour parking be removed and a uh, loading zone being installed in front of their uh, mission property. Um, is anyone from mission here? No, I'm just available if anybody has any questions. Yeah, if you, I'm Marie if you Allen, would, please, I'm the, please state your name and address. For I'm the Marie Allen. I'm the chairman of the board. I live at 1111 Linwood. Um, we just, it would benefit the people that use our services. We have people dropping laundry <coughs> off. We have a lot of disabled patrons. Uh, we have people dropping off lots of donations. It just, it, it would just be helpful to us if we had the opportunity to have a, an unloading zone. How many parking spaces will this take away? That'd be three. Are most loading zones that big in Rolla? I would say on average, the average is probably two. Okay. My question would be, why do you need an extra large loading zone? I, two would be sufficient. Yeah. It's worth noting, I, I'm protective of parking downtown. There's a lot more stuff going downtown and most of you know how I feel on the parking issue, but in any event, on the corner there, that first parking spot has a yellow line. So there's essentially already, already one no parking spot. I would ask council to consider granting one more, which is right in front of the door. So in effect, you would have two. If the reason is to accommodate drop-offs, then you really got two spots to accommodate drop-offs. But that's your decision. I have a quick question on the map. Just um, I'm looking at the one I think you are with A Street there. Um, <coughs> are you saying that on the right side? Yes. We see a white car, and then there's no, there's nobody you go, parked after it. Yeah. If you go on that okay. on that east side, right, right there, there is a yellow stripe on that one space. There's no parking at all times. And I was just wanted to ask because it looks like between and the door, that, incidentally, the the door is, is where, where the white, white car. car is. Gotcha. Okay, so it looks like one has already been removed. We were mentioning we take away three spots, but it looks like there's a white car, a blue looking car, a space, another car, another car, and another space. So it looks like, just I just want to clarify, it looks like there's one, two, three, four, five, six parking spots there. And it's we have the block. Right. So as opposed to taking away three, we would be taking away six if we took all of them. If we do it, you're saying we take away one. I'm, I'm more, suggesting yeah. you consider. If the intent is to accommodate drop-offs, whether that's person or articles, grant the one that's right in front of the door, and then the one in front of that already is blocked off and has a yellow line anyway. So we'd only be taking away one space and yes, making that's a what I'm, two space size yeah. loading station. Darren, John, I mean, I defer to you guys, but. Yeah, it, it would be, I'm guessing it would be about 20 foot. Uh, normally we say parking spot is 20 feet. Yeah. Right. And then we got 10 foot on the corner that it was already blocked. So it would be a total of about 30 foot on that, right. coming off that alley. This accommodates our needs, but doesn't take away half the block. I mean, I'll I make that motion. Cheap. Okay. I mean, if it's marked yellow, I'm not sure that if even if someone was unloading that they wouldn't get a ticket. That's true. But we can change that to part of the loading zone, can't we? But we do agree that two spots would work. Take one away, combine it with the existing yellow. Is there a reason? Is but there if a reason the yellow one? doesn't work, then we would still need two. The right? yellow should work. Yellow is no parking. Unless the yellow was no park. But the thing is, if it's loading zone, then you couldn't park in the no parking. And if the reason they put the yellow strip on the ground was because they don't want people parking there, for example, when Same. someone comes out the alley, that is a problem. I think that's what Darren was saying, that if somebody's staying there and running something in the door, I don't think the police are going to give them a ticket. I, don't, I mean, I think that seems reasonable. I was just going to say, I wonder if, because nobody's really supposed to be parking there so close to the edge, if we shouldn't do that edge, but which is still no parking and then two spots for a loading zone. But uh, that's what I'd feel comfortable with that. But I'd also feel comfortable if we just were able to do one, I guess. Daniel? I mean, uh, as long as we can utilize that yellow space, I don't see an issue. If, if uh, that's Marie, you. Yeah, that's acceptable to us. Is that okay if someone actually uses a loading zone, Darren, based on that being yellow? I don't write parking tickets. 
<laughs> so we changed it to a loading zone. It's fine. I just didn't know if the public works department had purposely made it yellow because coming out of the alley was a safety concern or something. Yes. I'm sure it was a visibility issue. So if someone parks there I mean, to load and unload their so laundry many, and a truck comes you know, out. My ordinance within so many feet of an intersection or driveway, you, you can't park within so many feet. My guess is we were having problems is why we painted it yellow. And so if it becomes a loading zone and people park there to load and unload, it could be a problem or no? Still going to be a problem. <laughs> that's why I'm wondering if we shouldn't do that's that's no parking because it's a public work safety issue and then two spaces. Two spaces. How many that? people come in a day to drop something off? We serve anywhere upwards of 50 to 60 people in a day. It stays fairly busy. Yeah. But you have that many people dropping stuff off every day? Yeah. Every time I've gone to drop something off, I've actually had to pull in and park in the yeah. little lot adjacent because there was no space in front to park. Right. There's there's rarely an open spot in front of the building, which can be an issue. I mean, if we've got people that are lugging laundry from all the way around the block. Yeah, but that reinforces the point yeah. that we have to be judicious on eliminating parking spots. Yeah. Those parking spots are in demand. Right. Typically, they're used by our patrons who, if those spots aren't available, are parking around the building. What's council's pleasure? I make a motion that we grant one parking spot to be, be combined with the current no parking spot and turn it into a two spot two parking spot loading zone. We can't do that if it's ticket if it's if that's right. illegal, right? We can well, that can be redone. Though. You don't want someone parking there whether they're loading or not at all for safety. Is that correct or not? By ordinance, you can't park within so many feet of an intersection. Gotcha. So they shouldn't be parking there to load and unload their laundry. That's correct. Okay. I, I would, would propose a motion to have two changing that and making it part of the loading zone. Okay. 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 Nothing would make keep you guys from changing that. Okay. So we can make it part of the loading zone now. Yes. Say that again for everyone's benefit. The, the current no parking spot, that can be changed to be included in the loading zone, correct? Correct. So that will no longer be a quote no parking spot it will be a loading zone correct okay and that won't compromise safety i would not say that no i wouldn't i would either. never encourage <laughs> anybody to park within that you know that close to an intersection for sight distance when you say intersection you're talking about an alley right yeah any intersection could be a driveway yeah. alley okay. but my question is how many people realistically drive through the alley many you're right downtown all the time many I couldn't speak. I, I don't have a count on, on the people coming in down the alley. I don't know how often that one's used. So, Brian, what was your motion? What is this part right here? Uh, my motion is to uh, reduce the loading zone to one spot, to the spot next to the current no parking spot. In front of the door. Right. And then to uh, look into changing the zoning on the no parking spot to make it part of the as a separate action part of the loading zone. Okay, so the motion is to grant one parking spot. One parking spot is, in front of the door. Correct. Okay. Is there a second? Go ahead, Brian. I have a question. Um, mm -hmm. Are you meaning? For the purpose of this ordinance, you'd like to propose that it be amended that the section of no parking would just basically be 20 feet beyond the yellow line, west I of the yellow line. You're not asking in this ordinance to state that the the portion that's painted yellow because of another no, ordinance. No, we can come be back. Changed to the, we can come here, back. Here, otherwise they would be inconsistent. Yeah, we can come back and change that to be part of the loop. So. Okay. There's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Second. I have a question. What is this parking lot right here across the street? Who owns that? East? On the east side? Oh, that's the one that's owned by Closer uh, like University. Side. Adjacent to Rolla Street. Well, I, I'm having, what, what is that that's parking right. lot? That's just it's part of Sam's Tire, if you're talking about the one that's just to the Okay, so that's a private business's parking yeah. lot? Yeah, okay. it's vacant now, or it's, on, it's advertised available for lease, but that parking goes to Sam's, the old mm -hmm. Sam's Tire building. Okay, so where are we at? Okay, so there was a motion and a second to amend the ordinance to allow for one parking spot in front of the, the door. 
All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? No. no. Okay. Let's see the uh, camera. Count them up. All the ones that are four, raise your hand. All against? This is against one? I'm sorry? This is against one parking spot? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm against one. Did you count them? Because I don't know if he raised his hand the first time. This is not. <laughs> I didn't move. Yeah. Run, run this by me one more time. Okay. <laughs> the motion is to change the ordinance to allow one no parking spot in front of the door and west of the existing no parking zone, which is marked with yellow paint. And the code, you want to combine the two? No, don't go no, no. We can't do that because that's a no parking one now. There'll be a space there, and Brian is suggesting deal with that separately. So we're basically saying we're going to one spot versus the whole street. One in front of the door to accommodate loading and unloading. Okay. Did I say that correctly, Brian? Mm hmm. Okay. So, for the amendment motion and there's a second all in favor raise your hand six seven okay obviously the rest are opposed so um, first reading an ordinance amending section 27-118 of the general ordinances of the city of Rolla Missouri known as the code of city of Rolla Missouri related to parking as amended Next item is an ordinance amending section 27-118 for parking changes on between Elm and Oak on 11. <clears throat> so the property owner at 104 East 11th Street, uh, Nick Berry, um, has requested to make changes to that parking on 11th Street between Elm and Oak. This will provide for one two-hour parking spot where there are currently three and uh, two unrestricted spots. Uh, so for a total of uh, three spots, two unrestricted, one two-hour so we're asking for a first reading ordinance to make these changes. Um, Mr. Barrick, is Nick here? He's not. No. Uh, he indicated he might come tonight. He indicated the reason for this is he'd still like to have one to our spot right in front of his business for customers, but the other two spots would be for employees to park in. Uh, for who's parking? Employee. Parking. Employees and citizens. Yes. Okay. Any questions for Darren? First reading, please. An ordinance amending section 27-118 of the general ordinances of the City of Rolla, Missouri, known as the Code of City of Rolla, Missouri, related to parking. Next item is an ordinance authorizing me to enter into an agreement with the Missouri Department of Corrections. Uh, the attached ordinance would authorize the mayor to enter into a renewal of a supervised release work program with the Missouri Department of Corrections. Uh, we currently employ eight individuals that work you know, half in public works and half in parks. Uh, we've been doing this since 05, and we've been very pleased with the program, and <clears throat> we would recommend approval of the ordinance. The uh, Correction Center has requested this back by the end of the year, so that's why we're asking for the first and final reading tonight. Any questions, Brian? Steve, the people they send out on these work details, they're essentially um, trustees at this point, right? Yes. They're good criminals. Well, relatively. <laughs> and they're typically not violent criminals or anything like that, correct? Typically, yes. Okay. With less, I think it was with less than two years they of service. They have two to three years left on their, depending on the crime, I think it's two to three years left on their sentence. Have we ever had, an, have we been doing this a long, long time? Is there any, any incidents? There has Did we ever have any anything at all work-related. Uh, we have had some some issues with uh, drugs finding their way into the prison, and they were they were out of the workforce for a couple of months. They had a the opioid crisis has hit the prisons as well as everybody else, and they they locked everybody down for a couple of months to, to cut off the supply. But they're very tricky on getting them back in. A lot of times, these guys are blackmailed into doing that because they have family on the outside; they don't really have a choice. But uh, 
it's it happens. It's, it's happened maybe a half a dozen times in, since '05. So, but all in all, it's been a very successful program. Any questions for Steve? I have one. So a couple of years ago, I know we had some issues with some trees getting trimmed a little, a little too short. Um, have we put any sort of training program in for these guys to kind of show them what aesthetically is our goal? We got a different supervisor who's a little more. Uh, sensitive to trimming trees that these guys are not tree trimmers. I understand that. That's why I'm bringing up the point. So if we're giving these guys uh, trimmers. If it's in the right of way, it's fair game. What's that? If it's in the right of way, it's fair game. I mean, we simply cannot train a, a revolving door of prisoners on the proper techniques for, for trimming trees. So then every once in a while, they're going to get a little too close. But they only work in the right of way. They don't obviously go on private property. All right. There's no other questions. First reading, please. An ordinance authorizing the mayor of the city of Rolla, Missouri, to execute on behalf of the city of Rolla, Missouri, a certain agreement between the city of Rolla, Missouri, and the Missouri Department of Corrections. Is there a so motion? Just the room, the final reading. <coughs> second. There's a motion and second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Final reading, please. An ordinance authorizing Bay or City of Rolla, Missouri to execute on behalf of the City of Rolla, Missouri a certain agreement between the City of Rolla, Missouri and Missouri Department of Corrections. Motion made and second. Roll we'll call vote. Crow? Yes. Shot? Yes. Young? Yes. Jones? No. Murphy? Yes. Henry? Yes. Williams? Yes. Mush? Yes. Roeder? Yes. Everly? Yes. Woolley? Yes. No. Is that a no? no it was just I said yes. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Thank you. Nine A's and two nays. Excuse me. Nine A's and one nays. Apologize. Ten A's and one nay. I'll get this right in a minute. <laughs> uh, next item is an ordinance amending Chapter 36 of the Code for Training to Right of Way. Yeah, this is part of this fairly complex issue of dealing with changing um, state and federal regulations as it pertains to accessing our right-of-way. And if we think of the right-of-way, think of the streets and the areas we have planted for public purpose and public benefit. Traditionally, we've had franchises with folks like uh, a Sprint or uh, the United Telephone that became Sprint and now Century Link with uh, the cable company, with natural gas, with RMU. Those are the standard users in the right of way. What's happening over the last few years and really is poised to happen much more in the next several years is this transition or conversion to uh, the 5G and the telecommunication changes that are taking place. In anticipation of that, both the state and federal regulations were revamped over the last few years, uh, really looking at this from the eye of the telecommunicators and preempting local regulation or control. Rala has generally been a fairly uh, hands-off manager of our right-of-way, and we've done that because we've encouraged the investment for purposes of technical, technological upgrades into our systems. As a result, we've had uh, sort of a lot of users in our right-of-way <coughs> and less than stellar record keeping of who all that is, and then it comes into a time where we have to do a project and we're delayed by notifications and having to wait for relocation. So that, that's just part of the process of not having a right-of-way or a good right-of-way management ordinance. We have been working on two ordinances simultaneously for the last six months or so. This one is dealing with just our management of the right-of-way itself. There's a parallel one uh, that's even more complicated, which is dealing with really the <coughs> zoning application of these wireless facilities as they find their way into uh, the right-of-way, whether that's on towers or itself, um, separate containers, uh, facilities being built in the right-of-way. So that one's going through PNZ. PNZ rightfully, I think, uh, asked for another 30 days to review that. So on January 8th, they will pick that issue back up. We're going to have the special counsel down for that meeting to be able to talk about some of that detail. What we're asking for tonight is a first reading of the right-of-way management ordinance, and then we won't bring this back until at least mid-January. So we won't bring this back at the first meeting in January. We'll let you see both ordinances sort of side by side before we bring this back. So we're proposing a first reading of this right-of-way ordinance at least a month before we take final action on this. It does a few things I'd like to identify. It's in your council packets, and I hate to be redundant for what we've provided for you. 
but I think it's important that the public understand what we're doing about trying to get a hold of this. So uh, I'd just like to touch on the key elements of this right-of-way ordinance. So the first one's going to require all uses of right-of-way to have, have either a franchise, a right-of-way use agreement, or a license agreement, by license being permission from the city to be there. There are applications for the process of a franchise of right-of-way, and these are complex documents dealing with a lot of uh, issues. There is a $500 deposit on that application. We actually have to refund any portion of that that isn't required by our use in doing the review, and we do have the ability to impose additional cost if it is more complex. Um, right-of-way users are subject to the city police powers on everything from safety, building, zoning codes. Uh, they're responsible for the maintenance of their facilities. If they abandon them, they have to remove them. Uh, they're required now to have insurance and performance and maintenance bonds, something that we've not really required of any of these entrants into our uh, marketplace or into our right-of-way. But if there is an issue or an accident, the city is assuming some of that liability without having some of these protections in place. It ties that to the statutory limits on sovereign immunity, which a few years ago was capped at $300,000 for an individual, two million aggregate, but it has an inflationary adjustment. So it just references the state law dealing with sovereign immunity. Um, it permits and recognizes that they have the right, these uh, utility providers uh, and telecommunication systems to be in the right of way. Um, but ultimately the public works director does have say as to where those are placed and where that permission is granted. There is a distinction in the ordinance between authority poles, which would be the city's poles, street light, uh, not street lights, but traffic <coughs> lights, and other uh, amenities that the city owns, but it draws that distinction between other utility poles, which includes RMU, and the law caps us at $150 a year. If they are to place these structures and facilities on our authority poles, but it delegates that RMU, because of their unique circumstance, the ability to enter into separate pull attachment agreements, and they're not limited to that statutory cap of $150 a year. So that's a part of all of this ordinance as well. All users are to provide digital mapping of the facil facilities. As I said right now, we have lots of users in our right of way. There's gonna be a lot more coming. We've heard from probably a half dozen interested in starting to build and create some of these facilities they're going to require to provide us digital mapping compatible with our systems so that we have a, a good um, notification system, a good way of contacting folks when we're doing our work in that right of way. Um, there are a lot of permit requirements in this ordinance. There is a cap on the number of days before we have to review. So one of the challenges we're going to have is how do you deal with multiple <coughs> applications that are going to be hit probably early in 2019 when we're trying to use our existing staff to do this work. But there are some limitations and things that we can deny if it's not complete information so that's all spelled out in the ordinance and there's a section that deals with sort of the excavation requirements restoration issues traffic control tree trimming in the right-of-way those are all addressed in there so uh, this is this is in some respects the easier of the two ordinances because it really gets us to where a lot of cities adopted 20 years ago more stringent uh, right-of-way codes but it does lay that out all in a in an ordinance that makes it really almost non-discriminatory for folks to be in our right-of-way. And RMU included has to provide some of this data because they're in the right-of-way just like anyone else. So um, it's a complex ordinance. Um, well, anybody from James, Steve, uh, Darren in particular spent a lot of time on this. RMU, Chad, and Rodney have worked with us for six months, I would say, or longer. They're actually using the same legal firm to do some work on their behalf with Pull Connect fees. So uh, we feel pretty comfortable with what we've got. <coughs> in your package, you'll notice a lot of red line. That was a little bit of a mix up on our end. We really wanted to give you a clean copy so you weren't seeing this. Once this had a public hearing, AT&T asked for and provided lots of comment. A lot of their comments we were not in agreement with. And so what you're seeing is some of the exchange between an AT&T request on some issues and our special counsel sort of saying where they could agree based on our input. And uh, so we will provide for you at the final reading a clean version of this. Um, but nothing wrong with seeing the exchange of information. But you know, we understand where AT&T was coming from, but we were not looking to adopt a right-of-way management code that satisfied AT&T and was done at the uh, compromise of proper controls on the city's part. So. We'd be happy to answer any questions you have on a right-of-way management ordinance. John, are we sh 
Are we comfortable that the city versus RMU nuances will pass legal muster? Yes. You know, some, one minute we say RMU is part of the city, the next minute time we say, well, they're sort of not. No, we, I mean, specifically we were, we were tasked with really sort of looking those out and Rodney or Chan could comment on that as well, but we're pretty comfortable with the way we've carved out RMU's role in there, but not getting them around the requirements imposed on other users. That would have been the more discriminatory factor. The fact that they're a city-owned facility operated on a separate board with an electric distribution and, and fiber system citywide does make them unique in light of the others, and, and the attorneys were very comfortable with that. Okay, so city poles and structures, so light poles, traffic lights, whatever, structures. Could someone want to put a dish on City Hall on the center? Yes, yes, and yes. Now, if it's out of the right of way, that can all be that all is negotiated. It isn't provided for in here. So this is just so in a threat. We have the ability to turn them down. Correct. Okay. And and the private market, they have the right to go to the private market and place them on buildings and things like that. What we can't do is deny them the right to get into the access into the right of way for that. But we can control where we're granting that. So, for instance, they could say that the only viable place is to put this on one of our traffic lights. And we'll, we have the right to require that they provide a, an engineering assessment that that traffic light is capable of withstanding this box structure on there. It's really geared more to drive them really to arm you who have the facilities out there, but it requires them to sort of address things like pole connect issues with arm you. So, um, downtown, another good example, the, tra the decorative lights we have downtown. We wouldn't want to have a three by four structure put on the top of it, even if it structurally could. Luckily, there was a car bot in the law that exempted historical districts and, and that kind of thing. So uh, it's one of the few areas they actually, actually left us a little bit of control. Rodney, do we know what the market price is of putting somebody's box on telephone poles? I need to come up. Yeah, that's very Since I got delegated to come up, I'm Chad Davis, operations manager for RMU. We have an agreement in place with mobility um, that we signed last year. We haven't actually put one of those one facility up for them yet. Um, the agreement uh, that was approved by the Board of Public Works is for $500 per year for an attachment. Now, there is a lot of wide fluctuation and variation in the market. Um, I think the, the small cell wireless companies are also trying to utilize some, an FCC ruling this fall to try to cap um, what they can utilize or what electric distribution utilities can charge for attachment agreements on electric distribution poles. That's going to court um, as we speak um, to appeal that FCC ruling this fall. So we'll see where that all plays out. Um, I would add in that, like John mentioned too, also the difference of RMU, um, the nuance there in this in this whole structure is that a lot of that exception is electric distribution being the key. Um, authority poles are exempted out because they're for electric distribution use. So and then as a utility pole definition, it comes back in because or they can be on either utility poles that are electric distribution so long as they have that pole attachment agreement with whether that's RMU, Intercounty, Ameren, or whoever else that might be within the right of way. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Any questions for John or, or Musta? <clears throat> so again, we're requesting first reading and then won't bring this back at the earliest until mid-January. First reading, please. Ordinance amending articles three through six of chapter 36 of the re repealing sections 25-42, 25-44, and 25-45 of the Rolla City Code related to regulations for right-of-way management and telecommunication wireless facilities. Next section is claims and or fiscal transactions. We have one, and that's a mi uh, motion awarding a bid for Project 44A. So the city asked for a bid for Project Number 448, uh, STP-88 accessibility improvements on 6th Street and Holloway. Uh, this project will provide for new ADA compliant curb ramps and sidewalks from Holloway from Salem Avenue to 18th Street from 6th Street uh, on 6th Street from railroad tracks to Bishop Avenue. Um, this is partially funded by some federal funding of $51,000, $70. Um, we received six bids. Uh, low bid was Don Magai Incorporated from Rolla for $446,994.35. 
So staff's asking for a motion for a bid award to the low bidder and first reading of an ordinance for the mayor to enter into a contract with Don Magna Incorporated for $446,000, and Any questions? Any qu questions for Darren? I have one. Yeah. Yes. So these numbers vary widely. Um, I want to make sure that we're uh, keeping an eye on ECOs that push those numbers up after we approve these numbers. You know, e ECOs. Engineer change orders. Okay. You know, uh, if we have to add a hundred thousand dollars to this, they weren't the low bidder anymore. So right. my point is that when I see numbers that are this broad, and, and I just want to make sure that we're looking at that. And if if we are doing these things, I would really appreciate it if you were reporting that back to us so we understand. Sure, I'd like to point out that I mean, the last job we just finished up, the change order, it actually came in under okay. budget. So, yeah, uh, one of you refreshed council. There, there are mechanisms mm -hmm. which change orders, if they exceed, they have to go up, back up the line through approval. So, why don't you yeah. talk a about those? Any change order over 10% in the change order or the aggregate of 25% has to come back to the council. Okay. But this is not, we've done several phases of this work. Mm -hmm. I think the guys that were from out of the area, which are some of the really high-end ones, Jeff City in particular, um, they're big firms. This is really working on every corner. It's just not what they do very well. Okay. And I, I just saw two Rolla firms, and they were over 10% apart, and so that's why I wanted to bring up that point. Yeah. Darren, the budget approach appropriation was 378 correct. so 446 less I'm assuming we still get the federal funding of 251 correct that's not we do mm -hmm. so 378 versus 195 so that's a big plus in your budget this year okay <laughs> <laughs> I know you can spend it quickly but am I missing something no the, we budgeted 378 but that would include the, the two hundred fifty-one oh, so thousand. Budget, or, the other portion. Okay. Yeah. So you got a hole in your budget. We do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, along, a, Mayor, yes. along those lines, I mean, why do you think your budgeting was so far off? I mean, when when we put our applications together for these projects, I mean, it's at a real high level. Uh, this is one where to you know fit some sidewalks in. We're having to narrow streets down. So that that's where a lot of the costs come in at. So we've done a, we've done a lot of these sidewalk projects. It just seems like we should be a little better able to appropriate. I mean, just so you know, I mean, before it went to bid, you know, my estimate then was four hundred thirty-five thousand. Um, but when we put the application together, gosh, over a year ago. You know, scoping it. Yeah, we just weren't realizing how much work was going to be entailed to, to you know, narrow some of these roads down to fit sidewalks on some of these roads. What's in the budget document that you submitted to council? Which number? What's in the budget document I submitted to council? Yeah, I think it's the expense of 378 and the mm -hmm. corresponding revenue of 251. Correct. So that's $68,000 hole in the budget. Can we stagger the work? Instead of having a hole in the budget for $68,000, can we do a little bit less in this budget year and carry some over to the next budget year? Uh, the completion date of this project is, I don't have it right in front of me, it's probably May. It's so probably what? May. Okay, so let me ask the question a different way. Okay. How are you going to make up $68,000 in your budget? Out of reserves. Okay, so you're going to the savings account. I think the answer that I was looking for is we're going to cut something else in this fiscal year or we're going to delay something so we meet our budget. I guess that's what I was hoping for. This, this, this project is part of the plan to replace all the ramps and draw, and uh, there's over 1,500 ramps and about $2,000 a ramp. So in the, in the big picture, this is a very small adjustment in the, in the overall plan to get all those ramps taken care of. I appreciate that, Steve, but if every department overshot their budget by $68,000 in the aggregate, that's a lot of money. We typically undershoot our budget. 
every year. Yeah, and, and, but we'll, <laughs> okay. we'll look for, you know, there's always some cost savings that right. we can incur over the year. And, I, mean, I don't make too big of a deal. I just want to reinforce to everyone that we have budgets, we have budgets for yeah. a reason. Yeah. That's all I'm saying. Any other questions? Is there a motion to award the bid to Don Magai? So moved. No, 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 no. We do this all the time. It's, it's, we're awarding the no bid moves. first. Is there a second? Second. To award the bid to Don Magai. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? First read. An ordinance authorizing the Mayor of City of Rella, Missouri to execute on behalf of the City of Rella, Missouri a certain agreement between the City of Rella, Missouri and Donald Bagai Incorporated for STP 5200919 Project 448, ADA Accessibility Improvement 6 and Holloway. Mayor, are there City Council comments? Um, I have one, one quick one. I'm sorry? I have a quick comment. I just want to clarify that um, when it comes to that Department of Corrections vote, I'm not against community service as a whole or those folks going out and, and helping out their communities. What I am against is folks who are prosecuted unjustly for cannabis are involved with those programs, and that's why I can't support them. That's all I have. I, I wanted to point out that everybody in that program is a volunteer. Some of them shouldn't be there from the get, though. Well, that's a different issue, but I'm saying they don't make anybody go on those work details. They're all volunteers. And I was a public defender, so I know this. And the people in the prison want to do that. I mean, it's, okay. there's so a it's big... Not the chain gang, right? No, no, there's a big pool of people in the prison that want those positions. Yeah, it gets them out. They do exactly. get luxury of pay that they get upon their release so it plays well. So it, work, it works well. Any other city council <laughs> comments? Mayor? <clears throat> yes. Um, it's been brought to my attention that one of the, the College Hills sewer district, there's been an issue with the, the contract and the potential um, that one of the, at least one of the individuals that live there so is not a party to that contract possibly. Um, I wondered if maybe Steve or John could shed some light on, on that issue um, with that sewer district since we're constantly entering into these bad agreements and now we have one that's becoming an issue or potentially becoming an issue yeah. so I'm not aware of it so I want to learn too what's the issue I mean I'll, I'll summarize it and you can correct me if I'm wrong so, so you remember on College Hills that the area that was being served by the city uh, we had lots of info and infiltration and so we had agreed with the district to replace their sewer system and we have now completed that that work was completed probably just in the last 30 to 60 days or so the project those are difficult projects because it's an existing sanitary sewer collection system and we're overbuilding a system around it so uh, there's a gentleman who is unhappy about the assessment if you remember that agreement it was to charge 150 percent of the rate that city residents would pay for a variety of services billing and other things like that there was also a three thousand dollar per residential unit assessment unless there's multifamily and I think they paid fifteen hundred dollars per unit the district board is a legal political subdivision quite frankly just like us we're equal partners under the under law as far as delegation so there is a College Hills sewer district public body who entered an agreement with the city and the way they chose to pick up a part of the capital cost was to assess three thousand dollars per hookup regardless of the distance that they had to run or the condition of your pipe or anything else it was a three thousand dollar assessment failure to pay that or to pay its way of financing that which if you remember we did over a 10-year period of time at I think 8% interest uh, goes as a lien on the property it's filed annually as a lien as the proportion <coughs> of that. so there's a gentleman that lives over there we had a meeting with him last uh, week It was a fine conversation um, just disagreeing that he should have to pay three thousand dollars his sewer lateral is in good shape it's clay at least a portion of it was clay that's old but it was still televised and working well but his waste goes into the rest of the system that was replaced throughout the College Hill Sewer District. Our suggestion was he takes that matter up with the district board who chose to assess that $3,000 per property within their district, and they have the legal right to do that. So, you know, we're sending it back to the district board. That issue, actually, the district board is meeting, I think, late December um, to verify the cost and the completion of that project. and their board can decide to do something different than that. But as it stands now, the board has entered into an agreement with the city to charge that $3,000 or to place that as a lien on the property. Okay, so now you raise all sorts of questions. 
clay pipe. It's good today. What about tomorrow when it breaks? Well, we suggested that to him, that the district was willing to pay the cost to have that replaced today. If he cho chooses to have it replaced today, the district will still pay that cost. If he waits beyond the completion of this project or the wrap-up, a little nuance there that you're okay. probably not making real clear. Okay. In my estimation, the, the, the line is not in good shape. It needs to be repaired. He won't grant an easement for us to do that, so I can't, I can't go in there on his property and fix it. He's thinking if he can not grant me the easement, that's going to save him $3,000. He doesn't have to worry about the lateral some other day. That's not the way that the thing works. It's an assessment, just like a tax assessment. It's like, as I explained to him, it's like you have to pay school tax whether you got any kids in school or not. It's an assessment. Okay, so now I have three questions instead of two. <laughs> we spent a lot of effort addressing these peripheral areas because people had sewer lines that were contaminating either the periphery or there was influx or inflow coming in and we were having problems. So do we really want somebody out there with an old clay pipe? I'm not I'm not gonna I don't I'm not gonna do any more unless the board wants to condemn for, for an easement. I'm not gonna do any further. Okay, right. but isn't it our problem down the road, Steve? No we, five we years from now? We well, televised that it was, it's yeah. the property owner's responsibility. And we televised, didn't it? It's it's clean it's running well and they, they acknowledge it was in, in good shape despite being a 30 year old it's got an offset joint in it and eventually it'll so down, down the road if it breaks and we have a problem on our end what's the recourse well it would be up to the sewer district we would go to the sewer district and demand some sort of action under the contract and they would have to order okay. him to do it right. well, let's just yeah. assume that tomorrow they say no, it's not three thousand dollars don't worry about it. your pipe is good where is that three thousand dollars going to get dispersed to? Somebody budgeted that this project. They, they still have eleven thousand dollars in their account, and they're required to keep five, so that leaves six. So they have they have six thousand dollars that they could use to to do that, and that'd be up to them if they wanted to do that. But but in order to do that, they would be making kind of decision not to charge this one property the three thousand dollars and assessing that against virtually really everybody else in the district. So. The district, you know, we'll we'll hear them at the end at of this December. Point, but at this point in time, between the, all the residents in that area, they lost about twenty three thousand dollars. I don't think we should do this. Much right it was we, a good we, deal. We've collected all but on a hundred sixty four thousand yeah. dollar project. We've collected all the twenty three, and the rest of it's all been placed on their taxes as a lien, including this individual's three thousand dollars. So there's a lien on the property, and, and it's penalties will accrue or interest will accrue over 8%, time. Yes. And one day when those properties are sold, we'll get our money. Well, in this case, actually, the it's it's not the full three thousand. They do it based on the ten years, and the his mortgage company has paid it. So we are we are taking care of for two thousand eighteen. They're going to start charging him more on his mortgage payments, which is what he's really objecting over. Which is not our issue. Our issue is we did the work. We're getting paid yeah. for from the assessments or from bill's, the district. Bill's been paid. But it sounds year, like we so. didn't do any work. We didn't fix his lateral line. Well, he didn't or grant us the easement to do that. We never had an easement to do that. We no. don't. No. Nor did he was the, the only individual in the, in the entire subdivision that didn't grant us an easement. So how do we fix? It? So, but we the whole point, like the mayor was saying, is if if we're trying to treat the sewer, and his lateral lines fail, we're not treating the sewer. We have to condemn for an easement. The district will have to. And if they don't, <coughs> what's our recourse? We can separate it. There's, there's actually provisions in this, this agreement that allows us to disconnect the homes, actually. We can't, we can't even do that. So we would disconnect the whole right. district? No. Right. You, can, you can disconnect a single home for non-payment. But that doesn't fix our problem, right? I mean, we, there's still... We did all sewage this, so going in wouldn't have that. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's, there's nothing being contaminated at this point. It's just got an offset joint. I've offered to fix that joint at this point in time as we go through this project. And that, that offer is only going to be good until I go back and we've got some stuff repairs to do on some yards in the spring. And once once I do that, then it's, it's the timeline's going to be over with. And it'll be up to him to fix it if it ever should fail. At this point, it's still working. 
Steve, let's be cautious. I'm going to say I think we have some credibility at stake on these agreements. I think we, we've uh, upheld ours with flying colors. Yeah. Okay. Matthew, any follow up? No. Well, I, I do. Was there any statement made about any homeowners in that area losing their homes based on this? Other than this individual I mean, who didn't hook philosophically, up. Philosophically, it could happen. Well, I'm asking, did anybody, was there any statements made to that effect by the sewer board of people losing their homes? At the, at the meeting I attended the other day, there was, but that's the only time I ever heard anything okay. talk about it. Okay. So somebody may lose their home over this. Well, somebody that doesn't, why. yeah, somebody that doesn't pay their, their, either their mortgage or the liens potentially could have their mortgage company foreclose on a property. At this point, the lien's been paid, so there, there's no problem with us. Yeah. Brian? I want to point out once again that when we provide services outside the city to people who aren't city residences, residents, these are the kind of problems as well as many others that we're going to have. Okay, I represent the city of Rolla. I don't have an obligation we don't have an obligation to help people who aren't in the city of Rolland. These kind of deals come back years down the road to haunt us. I've seen it over and over and over. Yeah. There is one slight difference though, Lynn, and I'm not a big fan of these either. However, our forefathers entered into agreement with treatment agreements and things like that that sort of tied our hands on these things. I don't know if this was one of them. Yeah. So, I'm, case, I'm not opposed to these agreements if the people agree to be annexed into the city. Then they are part of the city. But they want the benefits of the city without any of the responsibilities. I don't know you, That's Kevin, my problem. I, I can tell you on this particular subdivision, numerous times in my years here we've talked about that. And my, under, my recollection is the property taxes that would be paid, the city would not be breaking even. By the time you upgrade roads and upgrade the, the, the fire protection and all that sort of thing, well, that, that may be true in the short term, but 20, 30, 40 years down the road, you know, are we going to be the same size we are now yeah. with all of these attached sewer districts and stuff that are sort of Rolla but not really Rolla? I mean, that's where we're moving to. Yeah, I mean, based on the comments that James said earlier, you know, we're about 800 acres behind on what we're supposed to be annexing. So we really need to be seriously looking at bringing these areas into the community based on our own plans. <coughs> Cities tend not to do that with developed areas. They tend to do that on undeveloped areas where they've got the ability to. This is where we're going on services. services, though. I mean, we're we're the ones deciding to do this, and yet we're leaving them hanging out there. There's really no reason in the future to bring them in, and that's. Yeah, it's it kind of works mutually, at least in, in this case, because they don't want to come into the city limits, and quite frankly, I, I don't know that we want them in. Not that there's anything wrong with College Hills and some of those others, but if you look at real annexation growth potential like we did in 1999, you're looking for undeveloped areas where you've got the ability to provide sewer or utility services and everything else because RMU's not serving that area. Um, as the mayor said, you'll, you'll never generate enough taxes to cover the cost of bringing that facility or even it. And if we thought it was part of a growth corridor, we would definitely take that same position, but we don't see to the east a growth corridor for the city of Rolla. It's virtually developed. Everybody else is providing the key elements of the services that are out there. I, I understand all that, but the fact of the matter is we're still running sewer lines out there, and so we're, we're kind of doing it. Yeah. Some of these we had no choice. Though. I know. I think that's, but I think to Brian's point, like, it's kind of Rolla, but it's never going to really be Rolla, and that's, should we even be focused on those areas? We should be focused on where we're going to grow. Yeah. questions uh, citizen communications hmm. comments with the go to the order to Dale. just got a question John 801 East 10 there's been a pile of brush limbs that are sitting there in that corner and they've been there for almost three months now let me get somebody to pick them up. Yeah. Uh, 
we didn't place them there, the homeowner did, but in reality it was the material that was over the sidewalks and had fallen. We just need to get it picked up. You're talking right across from the football field? Right. Yeah. It looks bad. All right. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have no closed session for tonight, so if there's nothing else, wish everyone a Merry Christmas. Meeting adjourned. Oh, I keep forgetting.